let's talk about how to get your hemoglobin A1C to 5.0% or less. Now, why would that be important? Well, there's a number of reasons, but think of hemoglobin A1C as an index of glycation. That is, hemoglobin A1C represents glycated hemoglobin, and all that means is the hemoglobin protein within your red blood cells undergoes a reaction with glucose, blood sugar, and it forms an irreversible bond with the hemoglobin. So we say it's glycated hemoglobin. Well, hemoglobin is not the only protein in the body that's prone to glycation. Many proteins, virtually all proteins, are prone to glycation. For instance, if you glycate the proteins in the lenses of your eyes, over time you develop opacities, or cataracts. If you glycate collagen in your skin or in your joints, collagen is very glycation prone and becomes brittle. In the skin, it causes breakdown of the collagen, thinning of the skin, skin wrinkles. In joint cartilage, joint cartilage becomes brittle and it erodes over time, and over time you develop bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. If you glycate LDL particles, especially small LDL particles that develop from consumption of wheat, grains, and sugars, that small LDL that's glycated is much more atherogenic, we say, more likely to cause coronary disease, coronary atherosclerosis. So small glycated LDL, very potent cause for heart disease. Other proteins in the body that get glycated, like gly kidneys, uh, kidney proteins, that accelerates kidney disease. So all over the body, if you glycate proteins, it accelerates degeneration of those joints, it accelerates aging. So think of hemoglobin A1C as an index of how rapidly you're aging from this phenomenon of glycation, a major factor in the phenomena of aging. And we know that people with higher hemoglobin A1Cs have increased cardiovascular disease. And by the way, what level does that start? What level of hemoglobin A1C does the increase in cardiovascular death risk begin? 5.3%. I point that out because many of my colleagues will tell you, oh, Jack, your hemoglobin A1C of 5.7% is, is okay. Go about your business. Why would they say that? Why would they give you misleading, untrue information like that? Well, what they're really saying is you don't yet need metformin or bieta injections or insulin injections. You therefore must be okay. Shockingly, that is the conventional notion, the conventional definition of health often. If you don't benefit from medication, pharmacological interventions, then you're okay. The absence of medication means you're okay. This is, of course, absurd. This is patently absurd. At a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7%, your risk for cardiovascular disease, dementia, kidney disease, stroke, all the common diseases you're aware of, are dramatically increased. And, of course, you can get to the diabetic range of 6.5% higher, your risk for all kinds of things, coronary disease, carotid disease, stroke, amputations, peripheral vascular disease, diabetic gastroparesis, and neuropathy, all the things, horrible things that occur to people in type, one di type 2 diabetes are much increased, much of it due to glycation and other phenomena. At what level of hemoglobin A1C does risk for all those conditions essentially dissolve, go away? at about 4.9% or less. So we say just for convenience, 5.0% or less. So you want your hemoglobin A1C to be below 5.0%. Well, how do you do that? Especially if you're starting at 6.1% in the pre-diabetic range, or even the type two di diabetic range is 6.5% or greater. Well, first of all, if you're a diabetic on medication, oral medication, injectable medication, insulin, whatever, you need to talk to your healthcare provider First, because if you embark on these strategies, you can become dangerously hypoglycemic, low blood glucose. And if your blood glucose drops to like 50 or 60, you can lose consciousness and die. So you want to talk to your healthcare provider to anticipate that. And they should say things like this. Okay, cut your long-acting NPH insulin or regular dosing with each meal to one half your current dose. Or they should say, stop your glipizide or glimepiride, or cut your metformin in half. They should take action to reduce the medication. If they say, oh, you can't reverse diabetes, or there's no reason to reduce your medication, find a smarter health care practitioner, because you do not want to risk hypoglycemia. Very dangerous. 
Now, if you're not on those medications that reduce blood glucose, you're fine. Now, why do physicians often say things like this? Oh, try to get your hemoglobin A1C higher to 6.5% or greater. Why would they say that? That is a massive, stupid misinterpretation of some old studies, very large studies like the UK PDS and some others, where they took t existing type 2 diabetics on insulin and other medication asked this question. If we intensively treat their blood glucose and try to lower it lower and lower, do people do better? And they did not. And the cutoff was about 6.5%. That is, in a type 2 diabetic on multiple medications to, re to reduce blood glucose, if you tried to reduce A1C to 6.5% or lower, there was actually an increase in dangerous events like hypoglycemia and death. So they interpret that to mean everybody should have a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or greater, which of course is a massive misinterpretation. That does not apply to people not on insulin and oral medication or injectable medication. You cannot apply that to people who are not on those medications. In other words, it's the drugs that are dangerous that cause hypoglycemia and cause those events. It's not the hemoglobin A1C or blood glucose per se. It's the drugs that introduce that element of danger. So we're going to try to get our hemoglobin A1C below 5.0%. How do you do that? Very easy. This is so silly easy that you wonder why my colleagues don't do this all the time. Well, it takes some education. They have to be educated, they have to educate their patients, and they don't have time. Because it doesn't make any money, does it? To talk to you, educate you, doesn't pay. If, if someone can do an angioplasty or cholecystectomy or some other procedure and make thousands of dollars in procedural fees, why would they bother telling you things about your health? That's the essential dilemma of modern American health care. Thankfully, such phenomena as health coaches are helping online uh, uh, places like this where you can learn about things and not have to rely on the ignorance or the reluctance of the doctor who doesn't want to be bothered, to be honest, educating you. And, and often doesn't even know these kinds of things. So they're too deeply buried in the world of pharmaceuticals and procedures. So how do you do this? How do you get your hemoglobin A1C to 5.0% or lower? Avoid foods that raise blood glucose, and thereby hemoglobin A1C. What foods raise blood glucose? Wheat, grains, and sugars. <laughs> That's it. Wheat and grains, because the carbohydrate of wheat and grains is amylopectin A, which is very digestible and raises blood glucose sky high. Some of the foods with the highest glycemic indexes, capacity to raise blood sugar, are wheat and grains. And then, of course, sugars. Not bacon fat, not butter, not pork, not olive oil just wheat grains and sugars. So we eliminate wheat grains and sugars and we try to gravitate towards whole, towards real whole foods. Beef, pork, eggs, avocados, green vegetables, uh, legumes. Legumes can raise blood glucose a little bit. It's a different form of amylopectin A in legumes. You're not quite as, it's not as dangerous as the amylopectin A of wheat and grains. So you have a little bit more leeway when it comes to legumes. So that's diet. How about nutrients largely lacking in modern life that influence insulin resistance? That is the, in, the resistance to insulin that allows higher blood glucose. So we're going to address vitamin D, magnesium, omega-3 fatty acids, and iodine. Four things largely lacking in modern life, because not because of the diet, but because of the way we conduct our lives. With magnesium, for instance, we're supposed to get it from our drinking water, water that runs over rocks and minerals and streams and rivers, but we can't. That water is, is filthy now. It's got sewage and farm runoff and pesticides. So we have to filter water, but water filtration removes all magnesium. Likewise, modern produce, as compared to wild plants, is much reduced in magnesium. So we have to supplement magnesium. Vitamin D, because we live our lives indoors, we wear clothes, and we lose the capacity to activate vitamin D in the skin as we age, especially over age 40. So we supplement vitamin D. Iodine, because we've been told to cut our salt, which is silly, by the way, that's misinterpretation of the evidence. And so people have abandoned the use of or reduced the reliance on iodized salt and often don't get enough seafood and shellfish and seaweed to compensate. So we supplement iodine to ensure adequate thyroid hormone production.
And then we supplement omega-3 fatty acids because most modern people have abandoned the consumption of brain, brain matter from animals, which is rich in EPA and DHA, mostly DHA. And we can't eat all the fish and shellfish we want because of modern industrial contamination of the oceans that leads to mercury and cadmium toxicity if you eat a lot of fish and seafood. So we supplement vitamin D, a dose sufficient to raise your 25 hydroxy vitamin D blood level to 60 to 70 nanograms per milliliter. About 6,000 units is common, though it varies with, with weight. The heavier you are, the more you need. There's also some racial differences. So ideally you track over time, on occasion, your blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and we aim for a level of 60 to 70 nanograms. We supplement magnesium to obtain about 400 to 500 milligrams of the magnesium itself, so-called elemental magnesium, not the total weight of the tablet, like magnesium malate, magnesium citrate, magnesium aspartate. We don't care about the total weight. We just want to know how much magnesium, and it should be specified on the bottle you buy. It'll say something like each tablet contains 150 milligrams of elemental magnesium. That's what you want to know. And you want to get around 400, 500 milligrams thereabouts, provided your kidney function is normal. Iodine, we get more than the RDA, than the recommended daily allowance, because I don't think that's adequate. So we get about 300, 350 micrograms of iodine, most convenient sources, kelp tablets, dried seaweed tablets. Then omega-3 fatty acids, you have to get it from fish oil. You, I would not use any pharmaceutical preparation. For instance, there's a pharmaceutical preparation called Vasipa, which is pure EPA, 4,000 milligrams of EPA. Well, if you want the cognitive health preserving effects of DHA, not provided by EPA, you've got to add fish oil to the Vasipa. That's stupid, right? So why not just take the fish oil? and get EPA, DHA, the ideal intake, I believe, is, uh, is above 3,300 milligrams per day of EPA and DHA. I advocate in my programs, 3,600 milligrams of EPA and DHA total per day. You can break it up into two doses if you like, uh, but it can only come from fish oil. It cannot come from krill oil. It must come from fish oil. When you restore those four nutrients, largely lacking in modern life, they synergize to minimize insulin resistance. And that leads to a reduction in blood glucose over time, and thereby your hemoglobin A1c. Now, the last factor you address is the, is the most complicated, but it's really not that complicated. And that is colonic dysbiosis or SIBO. That is disruption of the colonic composition of the microbiome in the colon or even more worse than that is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, a very common situation that affects at least half the US population where colonic microbes, fecal microbes have overpopulated because of our exposure to antibiotics, glyphosate, other factors, allowed the overpopulation of those fecal microbes like E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter that then remarkably ascended into the 24 feet of small intestine, where they live and die rapidly. Trillions of them, when they die, they release their toxic compounds into the bloodstream. That's called endotoxemia. And endotoxemia is ubiquitous and is a major driver of higher blood glucose, higher hemoglobin A1C, and insulin resistance, and all the other things associated with that in expansion of abdominal fat, fatty liver, increased risk for multiple forms of cancer, type 2 diabetes, dementia, coronary disease, atrial fibrillation, autoimmune disease. So addressing SIBO, or at least colonic dysbiosis, but SIBO and endotoxemia gives you major advantages. Now, how do you do that? Well, there's many different ways to do this, but here's the way I do it. We restore lost microbes that colonize the small intestine and produce what are called bactericins, natural antibiotics that kill fecal microbes. And these are species that you've lost. Almost everybody, almost all modern humans have lost these species, three of them. Lactobacillus reuteri, Lactobacillus gasseri, and while my initial formula, I call this SIBO yogurt, while the initial formulation included bacillus coagulans, more recently I've switched it, uh, and I've replaced it with bacillus subtilis because I think it's a better microbe for this. It's a more reliable fermenter and it's a better producer of bactericins. Uh, so those three together, we can co-ferment them all together or ferment them individually if you want to be absolutely certain of getting very high microbial counts. Because when we 
individually ferment them, you get about 300 billion of each in a half cup or 120 milliliter serving. You can co-ferment them. The only caveat when you do that is we don't know what the relative composition is in say the fifth or 10th batch. In other words, they compete with each other when you ferment them together. And we don't know if let's say the 10th batch, maybe one comes to dominate and one is lost or something like that. We don't know yet. We will do DNA analyses. It's kind of expensive to do that. So we've kind of dragged our feet out doing that. Uh, so uh, what we do is if you're gonna co-ferment them, start from scratch, start from the probiotic capsule at maybe batch whatever, make it up six, seven, or eight, so that you're getting uh, relatively equal uh, proportions of each microbe. Uh, or if in doubt, individually ferment them. More hassle, but now you know you've got super duper high counts. And we consume in the co-fermented yogurt, maybe a half cup per day. In the individually fermented, maybe a third of a cup or so of each per day. And we do that for a minimum of four weeks. And that has done so extraordinarily well. You know, the antibiotic, the conventional antibiotic for SIBO is Zyfaxin. And it has a track record of efficacy, of effectiveness of about 55 to 60 percent. So far, the SIBO yogurt has achieved about 90 percent normalization of breath hydrogen gas. That, that's a way to measure whether you have SIBO or not, a, a topic for another day. So, but think about this. If the solution for SIBO is something that looks and smells like yogurt that you can make in your kitchen, how confident do you have to be? And the microbes of, of SIBO yogurt, especially Rotori, have all kinds of benefits like smoother skin, reduction of wrinkles, restoration of youthful musculature, increase in libido, increase in testosterone in elder, older males, increase in vaginal moisture in older females, all the phenomena associated with oxytocin, the hormone oxytocin, such as an increase in the intensity of love and affection for other people, desire for human connection, generosity, the acceptance of other people's opinions, uh, in effect, an age-reversing effect, because amplification of the immune system, musculature, smoother skin, we're talking about turn the clock back 10 or 20 years, so you don't have to be all that confident that you have SIBO. And in fact, I would encourage you, if you have SIBO, or you think you have SIBO, minimum four weeks, if not longer, people with really bad SIBO from taking lots of antibiotics, for instance, may have to do it for several months. But then, even when you're done, do it intermittently, maybe two, three times a week to make sure you're sustaining all the positive effects of these microbes. Because we don't yet know how to make these microbes, especially Rotori gastri, to take up permanent residence, as you would if your mom gave it to you at birth. So we still don't know how to make it take up permanent residence. In future, we'll probably will. It probably means providing an entire community of microbes that support each other and allows permanent residence. But so far, we don't know how to do that. But anyway, so there you go. The diet that doesn't raise blood glucose. The collection of simple nutrients that synergize to minimize insulin resistance and thereby allow blood glucose to drift down. And then addressing your gastrointestinal microbiome, especially SIBO and endotoxemia. And that little simple menu, it may seem like a lot, it's really not, uh, provides huge benefit. And one of the benefits, among many benefits, one of the benefits is keeping your hemoglobin A1C to 5.0% or lower. Now, if you do all this and it doesn't work, now it, it, the timeline can vary. If you have 150 pounds to lose, it's gonna take longer, right? Because weight loss could cause erratic blood glucose. But let's say you have only 40 pounds to lose. You lose those 40 pounds, that's when you're gonna see your hemoglobin A1C drop dramatically. Now, if this is confusing, incomplete, I invite you to see my other YouTube videos, of course, see my Defiant Health or listen to my Defiant Health podcasts, see my blog, William Davis MD. I got thousands and thousands of posts on that blog. Or if you need some guidance, some hand-holding, and some conversation to support you, I invite you to join my membership program, which is innercircle.drdavisinfinitehealth.com. Uh, and that's where we talk about these kinds of things. We have hundreds of videos. We have um, I think we have thousands, no, hundreds of thousands of forum discussions, and we have uh, weekly two-way Zoom meetings to, to provide support for you.